we're still here. Welcome to United Church of Hyde Park. And yes, we're still here and we are still having worship and we wanna welcome you all to this place. Yesterday I was watching this cute little video, it's of a family and they have a toddler. And so they were talking to their toddler and asking him, does he think he's a good listener? And so the little toddler said, yes, I'm a good listener. So they tried to, they did this little test and they put a video up and they put out one of his favorite snacks and they left him and they says, we gotta go do something, we'll be right back. And so they disappear and so you see him and he's kind of looking around and he doesn't touch the marshmallows. And then they send his sisters in to tempt him and he gives each one of them one, but he doesn't touch the marshmallows. Finally, the parents come back and they were like, you are a good listener. And I'm like really impressed that this little two year old did not touch the marshmallows. We invite you to listen today, to really listen. But we don't just invite you to listen, we invite you to experience and feel this worship experience. We invite you to taste and to see and to be present with us. We invite all of your senses to be here with us today. We wanna to wish you a happy Sunday. And for those of you that are mothers in any kind of way that you shaped and molded a life, we wanna wish you a happy Mother's Day. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to United Church of Hyde Park. Today we want to do a Mother's Day litany. Mothers come in many different forms, and today we celebrate them all. Mothering God, we draw on the image of you as one who nurtures, who gathers, who protects. We pray for those women who have nurtured us as mothers and who are no longer with us and whom we miss dearly. We reflect 
Upon those women who have influenced our own lives in so many ways, we give thanks. We pray for the women around the world who are working long days and nights to raise their children right now. We pray for mothers around the world. We pray for mothers who have fled violence and difficult situations, including refugees, and who have been separated from their children or experienced the tragedy of the death of a child. We pray for mothers living in uncertainty and facing the unknown. We pray for all the women who are expecting but aren't quite mothers yet. Thank God for the soon-to-be mothers. We pray for families where a mother's illness has led to an early death. We pray for those who step in to help with the care and nurture of the children, including extended family. We pray for the women who took in others' children through adoption and foster care. We give thanks to these mothers with hearts so big. We pray for those women who have lost a child to death and must carry on. We pray for strength and courage for the mothers who have faced grief and loss. We pray for women whose children have grown and whom they now seldom see. We pray for mothers who are at a distance from their children. We pray for all the women who have desperately wanted to have children of their own, but chose instead to mother everyone else. We thank God for the mothers in spirit. We pray for those troubled by the prospect of motherhood, perhaps too soon, or too few resources to care for a child. Mothering God, we offer these prayers to you this day Hear the prayers of our own heart. Well, hello again. I have a treat for you today. We are going to the Old Testament. We don't get there often. <laughs> we often find ourselves in the New Testament, but today we're going to a, a, a book in the Bible that we rarely look at. First Kings chapter three, 
verses 16 through 28. Later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house. And I gave birth while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house. Only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, Clearly, it was not the son I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living son is mine and the dead son is yours. The first said, no, the dead son is yours and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then the king said, the one says, this is my son that is alive and your son is dead. While the other says, not so, your son is dead and my son is the living one. So the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The king said, divide the living boy in two. Then give half to the one and half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because of your compassion for your son burning within her, please, my lord, give her the living boy Certainly do not kill him. But the other lady said, it shall be neither mine nor yours, divide it. Then the king responded, give the first woman the living boy. Do not kill him. She is his mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme this morning, the compassion factor. The compassion factor. Gloria Williams had a miscarriage at eight months pregnant. Her body continued to experience the symptoms of pregnancy, for which there is a medical term. Williams felt pressure from her boyfriend, Charles Manigo to have a child. Yet, she believes his abuse is what might have led to her miscarriage and to another tragedy. William's two sons from a previous marriage had already been taken from her deemed unsafe to live with their father. <clears throat> My abusive ex asked me to have a baby. He wanted me to have a baby, told me it would make him stable. I wanted to believe that. So when she miscarried, she kept it a secret. Instead, she drove from the border of South Carolina where she lived all the way to Florida Hospital. She reports on autopilot, stared at the infants in the nursing ward, and wandered the hallways to Shanera Mobley's room. She sat down and talked to Shanera, who was a 16-year-old new mom, who reported she did not even know what she was going to do with her baby. And then Mobley made a decision, perhaps thinking it would help this mom, perhaps still in shock over the loss of her own child, perhaps a victim of domestic violence, perhaps quite traumatized herself with no mental health intervention. A three-time mother with no kids, she dressed up as a nurse, entered back into the hospital, took the newborn baby out for reported tests, and never returned. Gloria raised Kamaya, also known as Alexis, for 18 years. When Alexis turned 16, Alexis wanted to get a job and she needed a birth certificate, except for there was no birth certificate. She kept pressing her mom for her birth certificate so that she could go and get a job. 
her and her mom had a beautiful relationship, and so her mom finally confessed to her. She told her daughter everything. The daughter decided not to report her mom. But slowly things would unravel. Gloria was brought to trial. It did come out. She was found and sentenced to 18 years in jail. She appealed for a reduced sentence last year and was denied. Kamaya, also known as Alexis, has met her real family and bonded with her dad, but is clashing with her biological mom. On Mother's Day, she reaches out to the woman who raised her saying, I know what she did was wrong, but that's my real mom. Her biological mom says, I wish I had never met her because the pain that she has brought to my life and to my family and to the four kids I do have with me has not been worth it. Who is the real mother? Today in the biblical text, we hear a story of two mothers. It's maybe a less common biblical story and yet much more complex. Here on the hills of Solomon asking for wisdom from God is an opportunity for him to show just how wise he is and win the approval of all those he's providing leadership for. And an all too common narrative of men being thrusted into fame on the backs of yet women as if to put more distance between them, him and them, they tell us that these two women are prostitutes. Before Judge Solomon now stands two women claiming to be the mother of one child. He's been given the task of deciding who's the real mama. Two women standing before him arguing over the same baby as if there are not enough kids in the world to love, as if we've got a shortage of children, so much so that before Judge Solomon stood two women arguing that they were both the mama of a baby new to the world. We all know that there could only be one biological mama back then, and yet two are making the same claim. How odd a story to appear right here in the Old Testament, in the Kings, mothers arguing over a child. And for a minute, we are held in suspense, wondering how Solomon will figure out who is the real mama. Judgment is a tricky thing because we make decisions on what we know, but what we don't know is limited. I was reminded of this often when I was driving two boys in the car and we would pass a police officer with sirens and someone would be pulled over on the side. It was always interesting to hear the two boys discuss what was really going on even though we were riding in our comfortable car. And I would always wonder, what do we know? There are all kinds of crooks and nannies and cracks and dark places unexposed. When others have been certain with limited knowledge, it seems a curse put on me to ponder, what is it that we really know? What is it that we really know about COVID-19? What are they not telling us? What's the whole story? Because of the course, the story, and the news we are fed is not often everything. And so often we can jump to conclusions about people and places and things without a whole lot of knowledge. In fact, one boss told me, Charlene, the less people know, the more they talk. I don't know about if this is a universal truth, but at least over here in the churches I've served, I have found that to be true that the less people know, the more they talk, and the more judgment gets dispensed. And so I'm wondering now, just how will Solomon judge this situation? Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, Talking to Strangers, mentions a conversation between then British Prime Minister and Adolf Hitler. Other leaders had talked with Hitler too when they had heard of rumors of what possibly he was up to. And so the British Prime Minister decides to have a conversation with Hitler. Here's the thing, after talking to the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister comes to the conclusion that this is a good guy. He judges that he makes his, some promises to the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister believes him. 
Other leaders as well that met with Hitler came to the same conclusion. But boy, were they shocked when Hitler did everything that he promised he wouldn't do. You see, judgment is hard. And Solomon at least gets that much so that God divvies out wisdom. And Solomon goes on to make a landmark Supreme Court decision in the case of the real mama versus the false mama. So let's start with what the text tells us. There are two women and two babies. There are two mothers when the story begins and two living baby. That's good, one kid for each mama. According to the first woman's story, she gave birth first, but the other lady was pregnant and gave birth three days later. And this lady rolled over on her baby and killed him in the night. Oh well. And having killed her baby, she decides to get up and takes her dead baby to the other mother and lays them there and picks up the living baby and takes the baby. The lady says, when I woke up, I saw that my son was dead. But upon further notice and inspection, I realized this wasn't my son at all. That low down heifer took my son as her own. Now because she threw the ball, the other lady is swinging. She's defensive. And she swears that the story that the other lady is spitting is untrue and that her son is alive. And this lady has just fabricated one of the best lies I have ever heard. Is your head hurting? Don't let nobody tell you ever that the Bible isn't interesting. I read a lot of fiction, and this story is up there among incredible. So who's the real mama? And just so you know, motherhood is about more than who delivers babies. But before I tell you what King Solomon says and does, what do you think? Who's the real mama? Well, you already know the real mama because I read the text to you just a few seconds ago. And I know who the real mama is because I read the story before you, or maybe I didn't, or I think I read it before you. This text rose to me this week, and really, I thought it was a safe text. It was easy until I felt the Lord speaking to me in the middle of the week. And maybe God works differently for you, but when I'm getting sure of myself, God usually throws a curveball in the middle of the week to humble me, maybe to make me curious, maybe to keep me in prayer, maybe to hold me in relationship, in tension with the text a little bit longer. So I'm not an apostle, and I'm not a bishop, and I'm not a prophet or a king or a judge. And 15 years ago, I wasn't even a mother. So I started pondering this. Both ladies are the real mother. Yeah, you heard me. Both ladies are the real mother. Motherhood is a sacrifice. Folks love to put that one up there and beat us down with the virtuous woman in Proverbs, stop. But mothers, at least the ones I've met, are way more complicated and rich and full of color than the woman in Proverbs. Look, I was looking at the red table this week and they decided to honor three women who had been doing labor and sacrifice since COVID-19. One of them was a nurse. We are nurses. But we are also doctors. One of them was a cafeteria worker. We are cafeteria workers trying to feed babies even when school is out. We are helpers. We are many things, but we are human. We are vulnerable. We are trying like most to do the best with what we got, but some of us don't have a lot to work with. Nishi Nas says, you have some people who make decisions in their brokenness and it only hurts them. And there are other people who make decisions in their pain and that ripple effect is far and wide. If you had a great mama, great, but not all humans have had great mamas. Some folks have had terrible mamas and some have had their mamas ripped away too soon and that hurts. And when you get all up in your mother's garden, well, there are all kinds of things growing and things threatening to take life, and that's for real. 
I imagine it's complicated and that covers some of it and that's, that's, that's for real. But it doesn't make our mother any less real and that's why I say both of these ladies were real mamas just because. Just because we're complicated, <laughs> we're nuanced. For Alexis, AKA Kamaya, her real mom is the one who stole her from the hospital, probably still in pain herself and raised her not the lady that gave birth to her and has been missing her for all of 18 years. Just keep your finger on that and let's see what Solomon has to say. Solomon lets the moms talk and the more they talk, the more things don't get resolved. Each woman is holding fast to I'm the real mama. Each is asserting that the living child is theirs and no one claims the dead child. Think about that. They each make their case for why this child, this living child, is their child. And finally, the wisdom of God, like rainfall, comes down upon Solomon. Okay, since I cannot decide who is lying and who is telling the truth, I'm just going to cut this baby in half and give one part to you and one part to you. But it's a trick statement. So the lady whose baby was living said, don't do that. Let the child live. But who is the mama whose baby is living? The second lady said, okay, I'll take my half and give her her half. And that's how Solomon feels he came to know who the real mama was. But even in that, I'm not persuaded with Solomon's wisdom. But this is a sermon, so I ain't going down that road today. Here is the good news that falls from God's lip to Solomon, to mine, to yours, because of the compassion in her for her son. She would rather give him up than to see him die. Compassion is a powerful tool in a mother's life, but compassion is a powerful tool in the believer's life. When the love that burns inside of us not only allows us to walk towards others with respect, but when that same love even necessitates letting go of someone that they may live. It's Mother's Day, and this is a beautiful and a hard day, but this text reminds us that we all have stories that sometimes reek with horror. The gift we bring as mothers and daddies and lovers and brothers and sisters and cousins and friends and humans, the real gift we offer especially to those that cry the loudest and make bad choices, is the gift of compassion. We can listen when others jump to judgment and conclusion. We can listen when others are riddled with fear and anger and hate and bigotry. We can hear the spirit behind what others share. When we listen to people's stories, the whole story, it makes a difference. <clears throat> Last year, a few of us from church went to a violence conference, except for they called it a cafe. I was wondering how this was going to roll out, and I was on the planning team, and we were trying to get people to come from Indiana and Illinois. We knew that the people gathered in Indiana might be of a slightly different persuasion. We wondered how to have this conversation. And then someone introduced to us what is called cafe conversation. It's when you open a conversation not stating what your side is, but you begin to talk about your stories. As I sat around the table with strangers, as Malcolm Gladwell would say, talking to strangers, as I sat around talking to strangers, we began to share our stories of violence and our stories with guns. It was a whole different flavor. Nobody was trying to argue their position but through hearing people's stories, a compassion emerged for each other. And then we had a real discussion, and we were all on the same side. I believe there's more to these women's stories. Often there's more to mother's stories. We try to oversimplify women and people, but we're complicated. Sometimes I ask a person, why did you do that? And they'll be like, I don't know. They're telling the truth. They don't. <laughs> we are complicated. But once we can hear each other's stories, there lies a door of compassion. 
And when we hear enough stories, we begin to paint a landscape. In a world divided and fearful and worried, in a world of pandemics, in a world of so many deaths each day, in a world where the economy may collapse, in a world where jobs are crumbling, in a world where some people don't know how they're going to make it, in a world of loss, in everything else under the sun, let us hear people's stories. Let us hear like the little boy that sat there with the marshmallows and his parents told him not to eat. Let us hear. Let us listen. Let us pray. Let us roll up our sleeves. Let us find a way to help. But let us not operate out of fear. Let us be overwhelmed with compassion like this woman burning inside of us, the real mama, because compassion for each other makes a difference. Happy Mother's Day. Amen.
It's offering time. It's a part of our DNA to be fearful and to worry. It's a part of our DNA when we're scared and things are uncertain to kind of to be afraid. And it's also kind of common that in those times that we may not give as much because we're afraid. We don't know. Hey, we don't know if the money, we don't know what's going to happen. I was sharing with you in the sermon today about one of the ladies in the Red Table Talks. Um, I shared with, two, with you two of them, but there was a third lady um, that they had on the Red Table Talks, and she was a driver. She was a driver for, for Lyft, and she explained that her resources were drying up because a whole lot of people were not taking <laughs> Lyft rides anymore. Go figure. But one night she picked up a nurse from a hospital, and the nurse was just exhausted. And as she was driving the nurse home, she just began to listen to the nurse's story. Um, the nurse was hungry and asked, could you please take me just to a restaurant to get some food? And she started asking questions of the lady, just peeling the layers of her story back. And the lady shared that the cafeteria closes and that often you know, we're on our feet and there's no food. And so she listened to the lady's story and she had compassion. And so she decided that she would start delivering food. She put an ad out, people started giving, and every night she goes with plenty of pizza and garlic bread and salad to deliver to this hospital to nurses. She didn't seemingly have a lot, but she did. As followers of Christ, as spiritual beings, yes, we can fear and be worried, but we have something else in our DNA, and that's called generosity. It is in our spiritual DNA to want to give and to want to help. And I want you to open the doors to that. I want you to open the doors to giving and helping. It is offering time, and we want you to share your financial resources with us. You can do that in three ways. You can mail it, and the information will come up on the screen. You can walk by and drop it off. There's a little slot at the bottom of the door. Or you can try electronic giving. A few of you have tried that. More of you can do that. All of that information is available to you. We do invite you to share your resources. We invite you to keep that door open to wanting to help and being present with others. Be thou my wisdom now. 
You are still our God and we are still your people and we offer out of the abundance of our blessings and resources a small portion of that for kingdom building on earth. We pray the ways in which you have blessed and touched our lives would be felt in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. So hello, you guys. You can see me and I can't see you. <laughs> and that's kind of cool, that's kind of cool. We have a few announcements. Thank you for sharing your joys and concerns. We will be lifting those up. Please keep bringing them. You can also message us, we love it. We've been getting messages. If you need to send a side message or you have a prayer need, please, it's not just on Sunday, any time of the week you can send that. So we thank you. We thank you for joining us today. Um, after service, we've been trying something new, and we realize each time we experiment, it takes a while for it to get better and better. Like today, I want to say thanks, Arlene. It's good to have you out here. Each week, we get one more person that we're able to get over the obstacles of media and technology so that we are united. And so we're working on coffee hour. The last two Sundays, it's been a little bit complicated because to get to coffee hour, which uh, we're going to put up information at the end of service. You actually have to get off Facebook, and now you have to, it's kind of like when you were operating the manual car. You have to get off Facebook, and then you have to go try getting on Zoom. And I know for some of you, just getting to Facebook is enough. But if you want to try it, we'd love to have you out there at coffee hour, just a time for us to connect and to share and to talk with one another. So we hope to see more of you today. Give us time to set up because we're adjusting too. Um, but try to come out there and stay out there. We'd love to see you. On Wednesdays is a smaller community that gets together. We tell jokes. We have been working on this for seven weeks. And I'm waiting for the, the, the joke that's really just going to send me laughing. But we get together and we try to tell jokes and we check in with one another. We'd love to have you out there on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. This Tuesday evening, my 2030 group, we are due to meet this Tuesday. Um, love to see you. If you're 40 and you still think you're 30 or you're trying to run under the radar, we'd love to have you come on in. We have a couple people trying to act like they're 30 that are in our group, but it's okay. 2030, we'd love to see you for our spiritual group this Tuesday, um, and that information will be coming to you in the email. If you want to know more about it, please also as well let us know. We thank you for joining us today. Happy, happy Mother's Day. Um, we hope you have a beautiful day. Do something kind for yourself. Do something kind for others. And meet us during the week or meet us here next Sunday because guess what? Next Sunday at 11 a.m., it looks like we're going to be doing this for a couple more Sundays while you guys stay at home and stay safe and practice good social distancing. Again, it's been great having you here. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Until we meet again, be well. Until we meet again, do good in the world. Until we meet again, let's keep each other lifted up in prayer. Until we meet again, God be with you. Amen. <laughs>